In this section, I will cover a very important topic for communication systems, which is called multiplexing. So the basic idea of multiplexing is how can we use a shared medium if we have several senders. Think of several people in a room and a discussion group. We can share the medium by what we call time multiplexing. So maybe in a round robin fashion, everyone can speak or we can do space multiplexing. So everyone gets his or her own room and can start speaking. Boring, but it works. In technical systems, especially in wireless systems, we can distinguish five dimensions of multiplexing space, time, frequency, code and polarization. The goal is always the same, multiple use of a shared spectrum. And we will learn that it's very important to have certain guard spaces, whatever space here means, we'll see in space multiplexing, it's real space, three dimensional space. In time multiplexing, these are time gaps in frequency multiplexing, there are frequency gaps, etc. Okay, so let's start with the first multiplexing scheme, which is space division multiplexing, SDM. So the idea here is we have several channels, several channels we want to map onto, well, the space. What does it mean? For example, we say, okay, we have a channel K1, and there's a sender at a certain point in space. And then we learn something about transmission range, detection range, interference range. So this is very simplified here. So just let's assume this is a circle. I know this is not a circle in real life, but here it's a circle. And we say, okay, there's a sender. We use a certain frequency at a certain time and also maybe a certain code. I will come back to codes later on. But if we place the antenna at a certain point in space and the next antenna is a certain guard space apart. So this is our guard space here. So this is real guard space. So the antennas are, let's say, 50 kilometers away and the transmission detection fence range is, let's say, a maximum of 10 kilometers. Then the guard space is big enough. Perfect. So we can reuse the same frequency at the same time using the same code. Well, we can use exactly the same setting again if we have a certain guard space between the two senders. Sender at the position S1, position S2. And then there might be a third one, S3, etc. etc. So SDM space division multiplexing works pretty well, for example, for the classical analog TV. Think of a radio station broadcasting in one city, let's say at 88.6 megahertz. That's one radio station in one city. You can reuse the same frequency in a completely different city some hundred kilometers apart, exactly the same frequency. And both radio stations can transmit their program, their radio program exactly at the same time, same frequency, same type of modulation, etc. No interference. This works. You cannot do this for a whole nation with one frequency, but you have, for example, in Berlin, a radio station with that frequency and Frankfurt, one radio station with that frequency, it works. So that's the classical scheme for analog radio. Perfect. So this is space division multiplexing. Well, if you think, uh, for example, of mobile cellular phones, uh, this would mean, okay, if you're talking and I want to start a conversation, I should move, let's say, 10 kilometers from this position. Well, this is not really useful. We will come back to space division multiplexing 
when you think of special beam forming, think back of this beam forming antennas, then we can form a special beam and then we can do something this, like this space division multiplexing. So, but that is one dimension of multiplexing. We have another one, well known also from the history of communication systems. Let's say, okay, if we have a huge spectrum and we split this spectrum into smaller so-called frequency bands. So, let's come back to our example, analog radio stations. We could say, okay, one radio station operates here around this 88.6 megahertz. Uh, the next radio station operates at, let's say, 90.2 or whatever. Just an example. And the next one at 90.4 megahertz. So that's a classical way of multiplexing already for analog systems. We will learn how we actually push our signal up to this what we call carrier frequency. This is called the analog modulation. So we push our analog signal in the so-called baseband up to a carrier band. I'll come back to this later in the next section. But here it's quite important to see, okay, we can actually occupy a certain frequency for, well, 24 hours a day. So 24 seven, no matter, 365 days a year. So a channel gets a certain band of the spectrum the whole time, classical analog TV. Big advantage here is you don't really have to coordinate this in some kind of a complex way, but there's some authority that tells, okay, this radio station is allowed to send at 88.6 megahertz and the other one at 90.2 and that's it. It works for analog signals, no dynamic coordination necessary. Big disadvantage when we come to our typical patterns of communication, we waste a lot of bandwidth if the traffic is distributed unevenly. What does it mean? Usually in internet communication, you have very bursty traffic. That means you click on a URL, then you download something, a lot of data, and then you read the page, no data transmission. Then you click another link or a video, then the video starts. So you download again a lot of data. So that means bursty traffic. Analog TV and analog radio means the same amount of traffic 24 hours. You're sending music, news, whatever, uninterrupted. But in our, our digital world, we live with bursty traffic. So even if we watch a movie, we don't have this nice, even smooth pattern of data we transfer. So this is not a fixed data rate of two megabit per second, for example, for a video data stream. No, in the beginning, maybe we really download a lot of data and then well, just from time to time, some of the data. So we cache a lot of the data in case there are some interruptions or we have problems with the bandwidth, etc. So this kind of multiplexing, frequency division multiplexing is not very flexible. Because for example, if you say now we uh, transfer the news in one of the radio stations, we don't need that much bandwidth because we have human voice. And then we transmit a classical concert, a symphonic orchestra, for example, we need more to transmit music with high quality. So we are not that flexible. So that's one of the problems. And especially what happens if from time to time, let's say uh, K4 does not broadcast anything uh, between midnight and four o'clock in the morning. Well, then this radio station at 90.4 megahertz does not transmit anything, but you cannot easily jump into this now empty channel. So that's, that's a problem, maybe with the cognitive radio, etc. but not for classical analog systems. Okay, but that's the classical frequency division multiplexing. And just a side remark, this is also used, for example, for fiber optics, that's called wavelength division multiplexing. So WDM is basically the same. So you use different colors to transmit data 
on the same fiber. So frequency or wavelength, we already learned, same. Okay, so frequency, what else? We have time. TDM, time division multiplexing, that's something very typical for digital systems. So a system, a sender, gets the whole spectrum for a certain amount of time, the whole spectrum. That's, for example, the discussion. So if you want to talk, the moderator signals to you, okay, now you may speak. Then you use the whole spectrum for, let's say, two or three minutes. And then the moderator signals, now the next one may speak. So only one carrier, the medium at any time. So big advantage in for many uses, you can achieve high throughput, but you need precise synchronization. Think of senders and receivers hundreds of kilometers apart. Then the receiver has to know which of the data is now addressed to me. Is it every five seconds or every tenth of a second for how long? Or we need something like addresses that you say, oh, okay, this data packet is now addressed to me. So we synchronize either via an address or via time. But so you need some more precise synchronization and you can think that this is not always that simple, but that's exactly one of the mechanisms we use in mobile cellular systems. So TDM. And uh, typical wireless systems, they even mix those schemes. So a classical combination is the FDM, TDM mixture. So you, if you have a channel, let's pick K3, then you will get a certain part of the spectrum for a certain amount of time. And then you have to jump. You have to jump to another frequency and then jump to another frequency. You jump and jump and jump. So you jump through the spectrum and you place your data on a certain part of the spectrum, but only for a certain amount of time. So for example, there are systems that jump 1,600 times per second. So they stay on a certain frequency only for 625 microseconds. That's the classical Bluetooth. So there are some advantages. For example, it's not that easy, well, you can do, but it's not that easy to actually eavesdrop into these kind of communications because you're jumping around and as we will learn you protect the channel against so-called frequency selective interference assume there's some interference on a certain frequency that kills all the communication on a certain frequency so you will not receive anything on this frequency that means yes even K3, this channel suffers from this interference, but only, you see, for a short amount of time. That's only for a short amount of time. And then, depending on the coding, if you have enough redundancy in your data, using forward error correction, then you simply recalculate the original data based on the data you receive. So there might be some gaps in the data you receive, but you can then reconstruct the original data. So the keyword here is forward error correction. Please look this up if you're not familiar with this concept. Yes, sure, there are some disadvantages here. You need precise coordination. So, for example, Bluetooth, the classical Bluetooth, all the devices have to know the so-called hopping pattern. That is the pattern the devices use to jump through the spectrum. 1600 times per second, you change the center frequency for your transmission. But you have to know how. And when I will come back to the classical Bluetooth, I will explain the basic idea behind this. So far, 
We had the three classical schemes and we can always combine them. So at different positions in space, we can mix frequency and time division multiplexing. So and these are the three classical multiplexing technologies, space, time and frequency. Why classical? Because these are the multiplexing schemes we already know from fixed from wired networks. In wired networks, if you look at a cable, for example, you see many little tiny copper wires. And if you always pick a pair of the copper wires, you can transmit something. So this is already space division multiplexing because you have the space inside the cable and then you have many different tiny wires there. This is the classical old telephone lines. Or if you think fiber optics, so you have a fiber. If you cut the fiber, it more looks like this. You have an inner core and there you transmit different wavelengths, different colors of light. So this is where you have frequency division multiplexing. And then we reuse the cable for different communication so different sender receiver pairs this is time division multiplexing so SDM TDM and FDM well known from the wired networks for wireless networks we can do a bit more and one very interesting technology we can use if we have this time and frequency division multiplexing is called a cognitive radio so what does it mean so a typical cognitive radio is able to sense the spectrum. So the cognitive radio may detect unused spectrum. So you listen into the medium, the space around you. And if you notice, oh, nothing is going on, you may be able to use the spectrum. So you can share the same spectrum, that means the same frequency, with other devices. And if you do not do this at the same time, you can even avoid interference. So that's similar what you do during the discussion. You listen into the room and if no one else speaks, you may start speaking. That's the basic idea. But you have to avoid interference. So, um, and the technical systems, the so-called spectrum sensing cognitive radios, they can automatically pick the best available spectrum and check for, okay, these are the frequencies we can uh, use uh, for a certain time. So, how is this applied? Usually, you have so-called primary uses. Primary uses are the users that are assigned to a specific spectrum by some authority. So for example, they're depending on the region and the country, different authorities assigning a certain part of the spectrum, for example, to a TV station, classical analog TV, for example, classical systems. But it might be the case that this TV station does not use the spectrum in certain regions because they already moved from analog to digital television. And then you have something that is called a white space. No one uses this old analog TV spectrum in a certain region. And the idea then is, well, a so-called secondary user could now reuse this now unused spectrum. That means if the cognitive radio detects, oh, the spectrum is not used, you can reuse it. That's one of the ideas. So, and this can be done in a uh, not highly dynamic way, but more or less let's say, okay, in this region, we do not have the analog TV anymore. That means we can reuse it. But you can also do it in a really very dynamic fashion, kind of a temporary reuse of unused spectrum. That means you check 
the spectrum. If it's unused right now, you can use it. And as soon as you notice that someone else is using the spectrum, you stop transmitting on these frequencies. So just to explain this a bit more using the figures. So one thing you can benefit from is space multiplexing. There are different, let's say, regions, different regions where you can say, okay, now let's assume we still have primary uses. Okay, we have primary uses. That means, uh, for example, the TV station decides the transmission range is like this. And here also like this. So in the beginning, transmission range, for example, may include the primary uses here. But let's also assume the TV stations already decided we will go for digital TV. So maybe we will have only some smaller regions left for the analog TV. But already in this setting, you see, it's no problem for the secondary uses to reuse the spectrum here because there's a big enough gap between the range that comprises the primary uses and where you operate your secondary users. Now assume you switch from this old transmission range to the new one. And so you cannot have primary users here anymore, but maybe you cover them now with the digital TV. No problem. So they operate now on digital TV here. So what you could do now, you could even have secondary users here inside let's say the former range of the analog system you can have secondary uses there so space multiplexing works that's the classical reuse of the unused analog tv spectrum so that was our example number one and then you can do it also in a very flexible way that's the example number two where you basically check at a certain time here you can check which part of the spectrum is occupied so at this point in time you will see aha uh -huh, there's a primary user not allowed to reuse and there's just someone starting not allowed to reuse but here yes we can reuse this upper part some frequencies and this is then exactly this secondary user here we can reuse. So that's the basic idea, but you have to recheck. So the situation might change. So at a certain other point in time, you the secondary users may use a different part of the spectrum and the primary users up here use another part of the spectrum. So this could be very flexible, very dynamic. So that's the idea for the secondary user. You cannot guarantee certain data rates, but the idea is that still the primary user has some guarantees. So as soon as a primary user wants to transmit something, it should be able to transmit something. That's the idea. Okay. Cognitive radios. That's the keyword here. What else? So now we'll have a brief look into so-called code division multiplexing that's something very typical for wireless communication systems so the idea here is that each channel has a unique code what this precisely means well i will come back to this in chapter three because we need a bit more of how we actually code bits before we transfer them to have a closer look for now just think of there are ways of coding our data so that we can send at the same time you see the same time here in this figure at the same so same time at the same frequency same time same frequency and for now it's enough to just to briefly mention the classical example for code division multiplexing think of a party party with many people from many nations 
And maybe you noticed it's no problem at all if you have a conversation with some friends in English, for example, at the same time, some other people, same room, same frequency, same time, they use Finnish, for example, or German, or whatever language you do not understand, just an example. Then maybe you noticed, well, it's no problem. I can have my conversation and they can also easily have their conversation. There's not much interference in between. And this is the example we used when I will explain code division multiplexing and code division multiple access. So for now, it's enough to know there are methods to separate channels by a certain code. This is heavily used by UMTS, CDMA 2000, IS95, different cellular phone systems. What we will learn here, this is more or less a forward pointer. What we will learn is that the nice thing is you do not need that much coordination and synchronization. You can send I'm synchronized at the same time, at the same frequency. You do not have to coordinate frequencies, for example, something we have to do if we do time and frequency division multiplexing. We will also learn if we do this coding in a tricky way, we can protect the communication against interference and tapping. If you do not know the code, you cannot listen into the communication. That's a very nice feature. There are some disadvantages. So as we'll also learn is that it's difficult to guarantee certain user data rates because the achievable data rate depends on the data rates of all the others. Think back of the party example. If too many people speak at the same time, gets louder, 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 and then there's an upper limit. You will not understand anything, no matter if they use Finnish, German, English or whatever. It's too loud. The signal regeneration is also a bit more complex. So there are some disadvantages. I will come back to this when I talk about UMTS third generation mobile phone systems. And there's also an important technology tightly coupled to this code division multiplexing. It's called spread spectrum. I will give some insights to this technology in the next section. So that's our fourth technology, code division multiplexing. And then we can do something that looks strange. Uh, first, it's called polarization division multiplexing, PDM. But that has something to do with special characteristics of our electromagnetic waves. So waves, if we think of electromagnetic waves as waves and not as particles, photons, etc. Now, for this slide, think of waves, makes life easier. So we can think of these waves propagating at speed of light and look something like this, but in all planes. So it could also look like this and whatever. So if we emit a signal from an antenna, let's say a, a antenna that is not polarizing and just a light bulb, for example, then the waves are not all in the same plane. They are not polarized. The idea here is that if we have a small slit, for example, and you have all these different waves approaching this small slit, then we learn that this polarizes our waves. And behind this slit, we have only so-called polarized electromagnetic waves. And here, two examples of polarization. One is a so-called vertical polarization. The other one is horizontal. There are some other polarization 
right and left circular, but here just to understand the basic idea. So the transmit direction goes here to the right and for vertical polarization by convention we see the electric field polarized only in a vertical direction. So this nice sine wave is only in a vertical direction. There's also the magnetic field. It's always in a right angle to the electric field. This is why it's called electromagnetic waves, but that's high school physics. So for here, it's enough to know, okay, vertical polarization, aha, uh -huh, only up and down more or less for the sine wave or horizontal, well, goes to left, right, left, right, etc. Vertical, horizontal. And maybe you heard of this already when you have, for example, a satellite dish, then you might have a receiver that is polarized horizontal or vertical, for example, or right or left, circular. So that's a classical scheme for satellite television for microwave links. And the big advantage is you can easily double the available bandwidth by using at the same time one signal vertically polarized and the other signal horizontally polarized. And there's basically no interference between those idealized, perfect polarized waves. You don't have to coordinate anything. You don't have to synchronize anything. This is just by basically how you build the antenna, you already create a polarization. So it's, a, it's just a question of how you actually assemble the antenna. If you tilt it a bit, you also tilt the polarization. So simple doubling of the ba uh, bandwidth. Disadvantages, well, the ideal polarization is not always feasible. There's many problems with real antennas. You do, you do not have an ideal perfect polarization. And then it might happen that the waves in one polarization plane leak into the other waves and then you have something that's called a cross polarization interference. Polarization is something you also know uh, from light when it goes to your glasses, for example, polarization filters you use in photography, etc. So that's all the same effect, polarization. Okay, now we saw different multiplexing schemes. Think back of guard spaces. Well, space, not always this classical three-dimensional space, but what does it mean? Think back of spaces in frequency, time, code. I will come back to code. What is the space in code multiplexing? Think of it. What could it be? And polarization. So that is the idea. Then look up this idea of cognitive radios. What do different regions do with their unused analog TV spectrum? You will see in some regions you may use cognitive radios. In other regions you cannot use them because well, there are some regions that do something different with the old spectrum. So maybe you heard the term polarization in complete, from completely different areas. Think of yogurt. Well, look it up. Why yogurt? Okay, so polarization, photography, etc. And then think of other combinations of multiplexing schemes because you do not have to have only one scheme or only two schemes combined. You could combine many, maybe all the five schemes. Think of that. 